afternoon, yes. Uh, hello, I'm, I'm, I'm John Meadley. I'm the standing moderator today. I'm uh, uh, one of the co-founders of the Pasture-Fed Livestock Association, and I was its chairman until um, very recently. Uh, I, I'm not a farmer, but I did study agriculture, and um, I spent the last 50 years working in the developing world in Africa and Asia, um, and, and you wonder why, you may wonder why that's relevant, but I think it helps to give context, and particularly um, at a time when some of our politicians seem to think that we are at the center still of an empire. And um, I, I just spent five years working in rural India. Um, one state is 105 million people. It's where Buddha had his enlightenment under the, under the Bodhi tree. A third of all the world's ruminants are in India. They produce 20% of the world's milk. We produce, I think, 1.5%. So it tends to put UK agriculture into context, and 50% of the world's pigs are in China. Groundswell is about answering the question of why no-till, and maybe briefly why pasture-fed and why personal for me, uh, I've spent the last eight years um, working with uh, colleagues here to, to, build this, uh, to build this movement. Um, a third of the world's grain, 40% in the EU, is fed inefficiently to livestock. 150,000 acres of land in the UK produces grain to feed to livestock. And for me, having been working with poor people in the developing world, that seems rather out of balance. 29% of the world's earth surface is land. 30% of that is farmed. Two thirds of that is pasture. There's three times as much carbon in the soil as there is in the atmosphere. So, and two thirds of the world's soil is under pasture. So pasture is hugely important and critical as a carbon store and only ruminants can utilize that. Pasture plays a vital role in soil biology, recycling nutrients, the relationship between the saliva and the bacteria in the soil, the methane that comes out and the methanotrophs in the soil. Adamir Caligari, if you heard him this morning talking about South America, he talks about it being a biological chisel plow. I love that phrase. 70% of UK's water supply is stored in the uplands under pasture. So pasture is hugely important. And it's the natural diet of ruminants. And if you read the opening, um, uh, what John Cherry says in the beginning of the, the Groundswell Guide, he talks about how they've now gone uh, wholly pasture fed. They've gone mob grazing. And he says, where's the vet? And then you would have heard in this, the recent talk and yesterday about the health benefits of, of um, meat and milk that's raised wholly pasture fed. And then the financial sense about it. Uh, figures from Moore Park say that if grazed pasture costs a penny, conserved pasture costs two and a half P, and grain costs four P. So, and we know from work that we've done with Stocktake, the AHDB, in this booklet, which you can get on our stand, that um, wholly pasture-fed, the raising of rumens, is competitive with any other form in the, uni in the UK, but only if it's well-managed and you have the right breed, which is what my colleague is going to talk about. PFLA was set up in 2011 by a group of farmers with four objectives. One, to define the identity of wholly pasture-fed meat. Secondly, to ensure the integrity of that identity. So if people buy wholly pasture fed, it is wholly pasture fed. Thirdly, to work with others and not to reinvent the wheel. And fourthly, not to be judgmental. There are plenty of other people rattling the cage. Um, we simply want to show there is another way. There are now over 300 farmers from Orkney to Cornwall, from Cumbria to Kent. 60 are certified, 60 are ready to be certified, so you don't have to be certified to be a member. Um, the rest are on the journey, and I invite you to, to join uh, the journey. We have a wonderful exchange of knowledge in what we call the gift economy, uh, and there are leaflets on your seat. So in 1965, I graduated from Newcastle University, which was then part of Durham. Um, 
in agriculture. And there was a word that we heard was barley beef. Barley beef was just being talked about. Uh, and this was to use up surplus substandard barley that couldn't be used for malting. And uh, that, like Topsy, that's grown and grown. And now we've got animals that are largely fed on grain. And people are realizing the disadvantage of that, the cost of that. And there is now a shift back. That trend is now <coughs> reversing. Um, and for that trend to be successful, it depends upon having uh, rumens who are well adapted to eating pasture. And so we have two of our um, great members here, Rob Havard and Simon Cutter. And Rob's a sixth generation farmer, professional economist, ecologist working for Nature England as a lead advisor for conservation grazing. He uses holistic plant grazing to manage his pedigree Angus suckler herd in the Worcestershire countryside. His focus is on the marriage of productivity and ecological gain. He keeps his cattle out all year round on 400 acres, I think, um, that, and hay as their only diet, and he finishes all fat stock from low input meadows. His organic herd is selected on fertility and efficiency from a pasture only diet. And Simon, Simon Cutter, who is our second speaker, is the founder of the Model Farm Society near Russ on Y. Um, Siren Sester graduate. Um, he studied and practiced traditional farming for over 20 years. He spent time in Australia. Um, and he's been a pioneer in the rearing of organic livestock and produce. And he's a founder farmer of the PFLA. Um, and they're both wonderful farmers. And now, no more from me. It's all from them. Over to you. So, hi, good afternoon. Um, what, um, I've got about 110 Hereford suckler cows, pedigree Hereford suckler cows, about 350 easy care ewes. And um, what I want to first start to talk about is how we can keep improving our herds and um, do a bit on EBVs first to see, um, you know, to make sure you can sort of understand where that comes from. So I wanted to take you back to your school days and you'd have double maths on a Friday afternoon and the teacher would be going on about um, medians and standard deviations and you would all be saying, you'd look up at the clock and the clock hadn't moved again and 10 minutes later it hadn't moved and you wondered why on earth, you know, how on earth this would ever apply to you in later life. Well, today it does. It's amazing. So this, this is what you call uh, the, the standard population curve. So for any, um, whatever trait in any population, it'll always come out in that shape. So if we did disco dancing abilities of, of you lot here today, the best disco dancers would be right there. Most of us would be in the middle. You know, after a couple of pints, we can um, do a bit of dad dancing and a bit of um, dancing around our handbags. And then I'm right at the end with my two left feet and no sense of rhythm whatsoever. So that's a population. And um, this graph could be profit from suckler cows. And the profit line would be over here. Some people getting far too few calves from their cows, feeding their cows far too expensively, and they're back <coughs> down here. And the system of EBVs, estimated breeding values, um, uses this graph for all the different traits. So if, for instance, you thought your cows weren't fertile enough, weren't given enough milk, you would be looking to buy a bull. Then you're going to, and then you're going to um, just increase the profitability of your herd. Because we would say your best cow has got to get back in calf and calf within a year. It's got to have a long lactation, certainly for 10 months, a nice steady even lactation. And she's got to be docile and she's got to calve on her own. And the calve has got to find a teat straight away. And all of those 
issues and no work. Um, and no work, the biggest cost of keeping a lot of cows will be housing and um, labour. So if you can cut your labour down, so I would be sort of looking after my 100 odd cows and followers and the sheep and I wouldn't call that quite a full time job because I've used EVVs to help me out, basically. So in Britain, all these measurements and things with cattle are huge, hugely competitive. We all want to be the top EBV for this, top EBV for that. What I've done, I've used the figures just looking at my herd. I'm never going to win a competition for growth. We're just feeding grass. And, but as far as the, all of the Hereford Cattle Society, my maternals are way, way, way ahead of the average for the society. And that's purely because I've chosen bulls that have high maternal values and they make my job easy. You know, out of 100 cows, I'd expect to get 100 calves and I'd expect to only calve, have to help, I'd have to help the back ones, backward ones, two or three, perhaps one other, so 3% um, intervention. And the, sh the sheep would be similarly. So we, we need to be doing this for profit, not, for, not to win a competition. It's easy for you to fiddle your figures. It's, it's all done on trust. But it'll be fooling yourselves in the end if you uh, are not doing that, and it'll hit your bottom line. The measurements we do, um, we weigh all the calves at weaning. And so the heaviest calf is going to be from the cow that's given the most milk through that um, growth period. We'll weigh some of the, the steers when they go off. We can work out their um, um, growth throughout their period. And we'll, if, we, if you've got time, you'll, look, you'll watch your cows go to bull and work out the gestation time. Because most of the problems with calving are going to be cows that go over, the, go over time. And some can go over time for a fortnight, and you've got a great big calf that flops out on the floor, doesn't want to doesn't want to get up, doesn't want to suck, and it's all work. Whereas we can look for bulls with gestation periods of a minus figure, but you know, I'm calving about five days before normal. And so the calves can be quite small and they tend to be lively. Again, that's something I can get from these figures. And then also we scan, we ultrasound scan um, the cattle. Um, I've got my maternals sort of sorted now, and now I'm working on marbling and not necessarily growth, but meat quality. And um, I'm looking for bulls with marbling. But what's more apparent is I can, I've got to look at the heifers and see which of those, um, when a scanner comes around, I've got my fingers crossed that some are going to scan well. But only he can tell with his, um, his scanning machine. And um, I'm looking to increase marbling from pasture. Um, and then finally, I'll go for growth. We retail all our beef direct to the consumer. So meat quality is hugely um, important and I can sacrifice growth. And I, I'm very worried that if I go for too much growth, I'm gonna lose uh, meat quality. I don't know that and I'll, I'll only know that when it sort of happens. Um, I think what I also wanted to say was that um, in, in Australia and New Zealand, who are also got to really focus on their product, there's obviously a lot of a lot of cooperation between the government, the meat exporters and packers, and the farmers, and then they set their EBVs to what um, to what they think they can sell. So there's so it, down under there's four indexes: a grass-fed index, there's a supermarket index, there's an EU index and a grain fed index and that's all in dollars you know it's what so a farmer can look and expect to make more money from whichever index he wants to go for and whichever system system he chooses in britain in britain we're not that focused it, it, to, to some extent cattle breeding is just again you sort of throw or stab a pin in a paper somehow compared to that so i think we've really got to make start measuring more things um, they measure how quickly an animal leaves a crush for the first two meters. It goes through a, it goes through a, <coughs> a beam, and they're not doing that for handling, because they can handle anything. 
They're doing that for meat quality, so the mo most, most docile animals, the well, animals that take more time to go those two metres, are the best meat quality. And then that's set across the whole of Australia and New Zealand that, that that's, that's a fact, and then farmers take account and um, use it. So I think I've done enough on EBV. I think Rob will have his opinion on how EBVs might not work, because they're not the be-all and end-all. They're a tool in your management box. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Um, I think that's a bit of a grand title up there. I, w all, what I'll do is I'll give a little bit of background to um, our farm, where we've come from, and I'll just give a, a, a kind of a, an update or a, you know, tell the story of how we've moved from fattening uh, commercial steers on, on pasture alone into over the last couple of years into a pedigree Angus herd, what I've learned along the way, um, you know, mistakes I've made and, and other things, and hopefully that's useful. But um, I'm aware, you know, I'm in a room with a lot of knowledge, and um, I'm not here saying this is how, how you should do it. I'm saying this is what I did, and, uh, you know, hopefully some of it's right. Um, so, in terms of our farm at home, around about 2001, uh, we went from about 180 acres down to 50 acres through a number of reasons, through um, my father's health and, and, uh, and other things like BSE and foot and mouth, although we didn't have those diseases, we had, um, you know, the, the market moved at just the wrong times for us. And, and really, you know, I spent the next few years after that working out, you know, how I could make a living farming and that really sort of woke me up to the fact I wasn't that interested before and, and you know spending far too much time drinking beer and playing rugby uh, to be much use on the farm um, but that sort of you don't realize what you've got till it's gone really motivated me to try and uh, move towards being able to farm in my own right and on 50 acres it's not easy to do um, and so actually a meeting with John about five or six years ago uh, at a pasture fed livestock AGM where we held up a book by Andre Vauzan, Grass Productivity, and the forward was by Alan Savory. About a month after that, I started doing holistic plan grazing, and that's allowed me to go in the space of that time, about five years, from 50 acres to 420, and to building up my own, own cattle herd. And I, I've really got a membership leaflet here for the PFLA. I can't speak highly enough of the organisation. Um, if you have cattle and you're looking at pasture-fed systems, really consider joining because the, just the whole group, the openness of the group, the members forum, um, any problem shared, any new innovation that comes along that someone uses is on the forum. It's so useful, um, absolutely worth it. It's, a, it's 100 pound a year and it's the best membership I pay without doubt. Um, you know, as, as for cattle and sheep, absolutely. Um, those are some of the meadows uh, we manage. That's at Croom Court, National Trust Farm of 180 acres that we rent. Um, really diverse, wildflower-rich meadows. Um, I don't know if the pointer, have got a pointer on here. Um, you can see the, the pink flower there is grass fetchling. So it's like a grass, but it's also a legume. So I like that, it's an annual, we get a lot of that. A lot of orchids. Um, and a lot of people would say the forage value of that's not great, but we finish um, finished cattle that when we were finishing steers on the pasture we were um, averaging about 330 kilos dead weight finished by 28 months uh, everything wintered outside uh, on stockpiled forage alone and mob grazed through so that's in the summer uh, those are some of the finishing cattle and uh, we graze through the summer leaving lots behind and we keep skimming over the top taking the best the nutritional take is really good um, when we do that, even though the forage quality, some people would say, is not up to the ryegrass clover lays, um, and the quantity isn't, but just by skimming across the top, we keep taking the best. Um, it's really good feed value, and it seems to do the cattle really well. That's in the winter. Something we started doing this year is a little bit of bale grazing, so spreading um, hay rolls out right through the farm, spreading them out, calculating how, many, how much area we're going to need to graze cattle, and so we do two, two days of stockpile grazing and then we roll the bales over the fence and unroll them and feed. Um, we actually started just leaving the bales just tipped on the flat end as well and actually that was 
that seem better for the soil actually because they pull a bit underneath them, do less pugging. And we also committed to the wildflowers and, and the wildlife side of things and we make sure that uh, we buy hay from nature reserves, wildflower meadows, and that brings more species onto the farm, brings in greater diversity. And we just find the more diversity we have, the better the health of the cattle as we've we moved on. And that's just something we, that's been a constant for us. They're out all winter. And this year, I, mean, I see Bob came to see, see them this winter. Um, one of the hardest winters they could have had in terms of wet and cold and snow. Um, and yet the condition they were holding right through the winter, right to the end, my main concern was actually, you know, are they too fit to carve? You know, we, they were holding so much condition. Um, but it's gone, it's gone really well so far for, for carving. Um, these are some of our, uh, a couple of our bulls that we keep. These are both native Angus, so a smaller framed, stockier animal than, than some of your big framed modern Angus. They, they just live off fresh air. They're incredible carcass qualities, but also they really do off grass as well. And we just find that that works really well in combination with some of the modern Angus genetics. Um, in terms of the EBVs, we've used these, I think they're really useful and, and they've allowed us to set up our herd of, over the last two or three years by selecting those EBVs um, that we think fit our system and then we, we obviously test those then when they come into our grass fed system. So I don't think that they're, um, they're wrong or they're useless but I just think you have to be careful um, when you're looking at this and this is just something I'd picked up initially buying cattle for growth and then and then learning more and realizing that, that maybe wasn't the best for my system um, as Simon said it's not a race to the, to the highest number and that's naturally something that's going to happen uh, human nature is you know everyone wants to be top dog um, but we're now starting to see within the breeds the problems occurring from the extreme growth and uh, speaking to somebody at breed plan the other day who's saying that, that everyone's moving away from extreme growth quite quickly now because of the problems um, one of the things that um, that's coming up is people suggesting that they put in a, a foot EBV or a foot structure or leg structure which kind of if they're thinking about doing that that tells you a story about some of the problems that have that have come from from that focus on just production without taking a holistic view of everything you want from that cow. Um, avoiding single trait selection, so buying carving ease direct EBVs, uh, looking at that, well that's going to mean that the, the bull's calves carve easy, so if you're keeping heifers, then they may well be narrow hipped, which means that they themselves may not, be, that may not carve easy. So make sure if you're selecting for carving ease, that you select also for carving ease daughters, which is another one of the EBV selections. If you're not careful, you can push yourself in different directions um, if you're not looking at those. Uh, and also to look at some of the antagonistic traits. So single trait selection is never a good idea, and that's something perhaps, you know, whether you just focus on carving ease or if you just focus on growth. Um, and if we look at the growth side of things, you know, why do cattle grow differently? And yes, there's, an, there's a component of milk and feed and that side of it, but the genetic side of it is linked to the hormones within the cattle themselves. So if you've got the, the balance of growth hormones and sex hormones, as long as the growth hormones are dominating, that animal will keep, keep growing. But if you're hoping to carve at two, and you've got a heifer that's going to keep growing until she's 36 months because of that balance of sex hormones, hormones and growth hormones, then you're causing yourself a problem. You're probably going to, you're going to have to feed that heifer to get a sexual maturity. And so you just need to have a balance. Um, ideally, you have curve benders, that, as they call them, that are going to have good growth up to a certain age point, and then the sex hormones are going to take over, the growth plates on the long bones will close, and then the secondary sexual characteristics start to kick in and, and they become sexually mature. Um, so it's just you can cause yourself problems with that. Also, if they're growing until they're 36, 40 months, it's going to take a lot more to finish them. So you want them to have finished growing by the time they're coming in for their finishing period. Uh, and you can look at that on the EBVs. We'll have a look at some of those in a bit. Also, in terms of structural soundness, um, you know, if the animal's growing very quickly, so are its joints and its bones. Um, and if you want longevity out of your cows or out of a bull, then those very quickly grown uh, joints can be a little bit weaker, particularly on the grain. They don't seem to form as strongly, and there are other, other aspects that come in, come in with that. Um, looking at marbling, 
Um, I think it's good to be looking at all these things that are consumer focused, but I think we've also got to look at um, you know, what a cow is for, uh, converting you know, grass into food, and, and you know, beef is beef. We don't have to turn it into something else. So I think a certain amount of marbling to make sure you're not losing that uh, is important. But we know that from some studies done in the States that that's antagonistic to carcass yield and meat yield. Um, it, it can also be, if you're, I think as, as Simon said, it's important, and Simon's in, on top of this because he's, he's looking at the marbling in the heifers. But if you're looking at marbling in bulls, for example, um, a really well hormonally balanced bull is going to have a higher level of testosterone. That testosterone is going to reduce the marbling. So if you're selecting for high marbling in your bulls, then that can have an effect on your hormone balance and on the fertility of that bull, potentially the hormone balance of the heifers coming on from that and the fertility of those um, as well. Um, I talked a little bit can I just get that out of the way? Um, about leg structure already in the leg structure EBV. Well, what does that tell you a story? Too much single trait selection. Um, epigenetics as well, I important to consider that. You know, these animals have got to perform in our own environment, and um, from my perspective, they've got to be wintered out. They're on fairly poor quality pasture all year, um, and they've got to thrive in that environment. The epigenetics is, is the science behind the genes that are either turned on or turned off. So you could, you could take cattle with similar EVVs, but if they've come from a different environment, they mean, may not have the genes turned on that they need to thrive in, in a grass-fed environment. And I think that's important. So if sourcing livestock from people like Simon um, and other breeders, I've just sourced another 15 heifers from a, uh, a breeder on the north coast of Scotland near John O'Groats, um, and they are outwintered on the foreshore, on the beach, and the North Sea, uh, for the whole winter so it's about as extreme an environment as we have in this country and that gives me confidence that they can survive in in you know my fairly mild Worcestershire winters although not so much this year um, and then finally just be careful what you wish for you might just get it and that's certainly what some of the high growth extreme growth folks have, have found and, and, and we're definitely seeing and moderating the top breeders moderating the, the frame size of their cattle now in order to, to cover some of these other issues um, this is, which bull's that? That's the bull I used last year. Um, so you can see here, uh, you can just about see on the bottom uh, down here, these are the, those are the breed average figures for the EVVs. And you can see on the whole, he's, he's above average for, for most of those. If I'm honest, uh, I've sold this bull now, the mature cow weight is slightly high for me, and that's one of the EVVs I really like to look at. And you also notice the accuracy figures underneath, which is the percentage figures. Um, some of the guys, it's difficult in this country because we have a smaller national herd that we don't have the accuracy figures that they do in the States, where a bull, if it's taken for semen, might be used across thousands of cows. That gives really good accuracy figures. And in the States, they, they won't look at a figure under 70% accuracy in terms of their decision making. And those can change quite quickly once you add in more data from your own herd or, or potentially from other herds. Um, but so in terms of what we'd be looking at for the earlier finishing, I'd rather this bull, um, if, you look, if you look here, the 600 day weight, you can see he's, a, he's ahead of 83 the average, he's 100 there. I look for them to be slightly ahead of the average on growth rates. At the 200, slowing down to 400, and probably a little, and then heading right on to average on the 600-day six, weight. So you're looking for that slowdown at just at the right time in terms of their age, um, and I found that useful. I've looked at that in terms of the heifers and some and some of the finishing stock, and it seems to add out. They're difficult to find those cattle though, um, and obviously you've got the calving ease figures up there as well, and he's a fairly easy calving chap. This is on, I can't quite see the top, um, this is on a heifer uh, that we had, it's one of, my, one of my best heifers this year and she's about exactly where I'd like her to be. Uh, you can just see mature cow weight, exactly breed average, but we've got really good growth. Um, so in terms of that, it's that moderated, um, that moderated cow size. So, it, you know, I do find it useful, you've just got to be careful with, with how you use them and, and a really nice balanced um, EV, EBV across the park there is, is, is a good one. In terms of um, 
cow size. I know Greg Judy was, uh, was here talking about this a little bit. Um, I saw some of the videos of him yesterday. Um, one of my, you know, heroes of farming, Greg, and um, and I think something that the smaller cow certainly can perform. Um, it, it holds its condition better. So these extreme big cows, they take a lot more maintenance. Their maintenance is a, is a lot higher. They've got to spend a lot more time foraging and feeding. And if you're putting stress on the cow in an environment where you're not giving it everything it needs, or you know, every time it needs something, you give it some extra environment, if you like. Ours have got to thrive in, a, in our environment. They've got to work for me, not me working for them. Um, and that sort of shape is really what I'm looking for. Quite a nice, neat shoulder kind of a wedge shape um, and there's an element of hormone if it's not a steery looking uh, animal so you don't want these big steery blocky you're not looking for that finished steer look in your heifers you want something nice and feminine um, and if you look at the shoulder you can see the shoulder is prominent of the thoracic vertebrae and that's a, it sh that's how it should be sometimes you'll see when you've got a lack of hormone balance the thoracic vertebrae will be up above um, the actual shoulder blades and that's a sign of those, those long bones been growing a bit longer and, and is a good way of an indication there. Real good depth of thigh as well. Uh, and this is from a Canadian herd who use native Angus genetics. And they always use a lot of New Zealand grass-fed and American grass-fed genetics. And you go and look at you know, herds of these cattle and they're perfectly uddered on a thousand cows. And I, I think you know, they haven't got time to mother up a calf I was mothering up a calf this morning at 5 a.m. Um, she's not going to be in the herd next year. Um, you know, just when we, when we look into the future, how's that going to work for us? If we look at cow size here, you know, some really big suckler cows around. One of my neighbours has got, they've got to be over a tonne, huge dairy Belgian blue crosses. Um, and just in terms of their, their maintenance requirements, are much, much higher in terms of what, what they require in terms of feed. But if you can keep, although they produce less, a smaller calf, they wean a smaller calf, a smaller cow, you can keep more of them on the same feed. And they're also a lot easier on the ground, which for me out wintering is really important. So I'm looking for that sweet spot around about 650 kilos. Um, I don't want anything extreme in terms of frame size, but the key thing for me is I, I would probably go smaller, but we have you know, as you're all aware, we get penalised if we go below certain weights uh, in the abattoir. So I aim for my heifers to not be penalised. The steers, if your heifers aren't penalised, your steers will be fine in terms of in terms of size, of, as long as you've got consistent breeding. And and so that's what I, if I sell a bull, I want it to do a job where where a customer's not going to be um, penalised at the abattoir for that. And so that's kind of the limit on the on the downward side. I also find that whilst in America that 650 kilo cow so over 1,400 pounds, they're actually looking at about 1,100 pound cows over there but, uh, and saying that's the more efficient way of doing things. I've, I've tried that out and I've bought some smaller Angus and I, I've, we've, we've imported stuff and, and, um, and, it's, and I do find actually that our environment just isn't quite as harsh as theirs over there. You know, we don't get down to minus 30 or 40 for long stretches of the winter and we don't have long stretches of very dry sort of 40 degree centigrade heat in the summer. So, uh, where they struggle to put flesh on as well. So actually our, our environment's a lot kinder and we can maintain condition on a slightly bigger cow than they can over there. And if you go too small, then there's the risk of them getting slightly over fat and you're, you're then potentially affecting your fertility and, and you know, that potentially is not as good. Um, as Simon said, EBVs are all well and good, but you know, feet and legs, anything that causes you a problem or gives you a cost, Hair coat, fly resistance in terms of the welfare side, looking at when they shed off. Early shedders is a really good sign. Um, it's a sign of the, the fact that they're picking up body condition as well. Um, and you tend to see the early shedders also seem to have more fly resistance. Some really good research showing that 20% you know, of your herd, just like with your internal parasites, are going to have 80% um, have of your fly, fly population on them. And you see them in any herd you go in, you'll see the flies are, are focusing on certain animals and you can select for that. Um, it's got to work in your environment. I've talked a little bit about that. Um, and look at the future of what the cattle industry is for us, particularly after Brexit, if we're in, a, in, a, in an environment in the future where we're on world markets that might fluctuate. 
We know in Australia they're talking about 3,000 cows per labour unit, per person. In America they're aiming at 1,000 cows. Um, and these traits just have to be right in, in order, you know, never mind the EBVs, you've just got to take the work out of it um, for it to be profitable. This is some work that was done in, um, uh, in Wales, looking at the impact on your cost per kilo of beef produced of various management changes. Uh, I think it's really interesting because you can see the maternal ones, which is, you know, someone like Simon who's worked really hard for 10 years, you know, it takes time to, to get these in, into place. And, you know, he's going to be reaping the benefits of increased calf survival, the reduced calving period, his feed costs will be down for, for a number of those reasons, and the cow longevity as well. And that makes up the majority of those cost savings. And if you look at the impact of a terminal sire with a high EBV, that's, that's the lowest amount in terms, of, in terms of what it gives you. And if you're keeping heifers from that high EBV terminal sire, you've also got to think about everything we've just talked about, about the impact of high growth rates on your cows. Because that, that might be what you want in the calf, but it might not be what you want in the cows. By all means, use a terminal bull. That's, you know, use hybrid vigour. To, you know, and get the advantage of that. But in terms of what you're keeping in your heifers, um, I, that's what you know, I'm aiming for you know, using a maternal bull that also has acceptable figures elsewhere because a live calf is far more important than anything else and a problem free. Um, again, just to look at some figures in terms of costs, the fertility, increasing your fertility, I think 60% of UK suckler herds are, look, are weaning about 85% of the, of the calves to cows, which, which isn't great, to be honest. And um, moving it up to 95%, which folks like Simon will be achieving, you know, significant monetary difference and something that you wouldn't be able to move your weight to, on average by 30 kilos per head with your terminal bulls very quickly. So, because you're going to have to start keeping heifers to start chasing that and then you start coming into the other problems again. So th those fertility and the maternal things that Simon's talking about, absolutely vital. Um, how are we doing for time? All right, we've got 20 minutes left. Um, so keep it simple. Does she bring a calf every year, trouble free, holds condition, and then breeds back? And if they do that, that's a good cow. You know, essentially, you add in the longevity. People talk about doing a foot EPD. Well, the, the best thing to do on that if you, was, would be to just have a longevity, look at the longevity um, of a cow because the ones that last are the ones we should be breeding from to give us those, those cost savings. Um, old Granny was, um, she was the foundation cow of the entire Angus herd, um, the first cow in the Angus herd book a couple of hundred years ago. Um, she... Uh, had a first calf at three, and then had a calf every single year uh, until she was 27. Uh, so when we talk about genetic progress, 200 years ago, you know that that's a profitable animal, and that was that was hailed. There were statues made of old granny and all sorts of things because of what she achieved, and and then they bred from those animals. Um, with a number of other pasture-fed breeders, we're working together. Something that's important. That, Simon and I both agree, is, is, is not trying to corner the market in all these genetics, but to share them um, across the industry. And we're importing um, genetics from Pine Bank, a lime bred herd, entirely off grass, selected on optimal growth, not extreme growth. So the ideal growth on grass alone. Y Angus, North America, and the native Angus we have here. I think some of those genetics we don't have quite as harsh an environment, so mixing some of the modern Angus in there as well is just giving, I, I find that quite useful, and it work, it's working well so far, but we're early days. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Question? Any questions? Oh, yeah. Oh, hello. Um, I, I'd be very interested in uh, seeing whether, asking whether you've compared pedigree, the, you're both running pedigree herds, 
and comparing that uh, or your performance there with uh, crossbred herds of one sort or another? And if you have considered crossbreeds, what kind of crossbreeds that you, you know, what kind of breeding you're looking at? Um, do you want to come up as well? Because you... You may as well both stand there for the Q&A. Yeah, I think that's probably best. Well, in terms of the which crossbreds to use, um, you've got a Hereford breeder and an Angus breeder, so a black baldy would be just the job, wouldn't it? Mm. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, a hybrid figure... I think it's uh, the, the, the research shows a 16% increase uh, in performance. But um, only in the first cross? Yes. Where do you go after you've done the first cross? You are going to have to buy in black baldies, aren't you? Buy in or black baldies and use a terminal sire. Right, yeah. And then you've got another yeah. hybrid vigour. But it's, yeah. But breed plan is free, to, it's free for you, is it? Yes. yes. So by being members of the Pedigree Breed Society, we have access to breed plan for free, which I think is... Excellent. Excellent, yeah. yeah. But you, so if you were a crossbreeder, you'd have to fund it yourself, and you wouldn't, you'd, have, you, you'd struggle to get links into um, other herds by being a crossbreeder. So like, like Rob's bulls from New Zealand, you know, they link into his, you know, his worldwide scheme, isn't it? Breed plans worldwide, so you, the figures right. relate. So being a crossbreeder, you would struggle. But you see, Britain led the world in cattle genetics for... 100 years today without any EBVs or anything. That was the word, you know, just by the eyes and observations of British stock people. So you can't decry that. We did it. And we should get back to where we were, I think. And um, yeah, EBVs are just another tool. And it might, my worry now is I'm not going to live long enough to do what I want to do <laughs> with cattle. But EBVs might just help that along. And the question you asked about uh, the comparison with commercial cattle, I think probably at the top end in terms of, we'd be probably talking about growth weights and if we're talking about just direct performance, the, certainly the Aberdeen Angus and I'm pretty sure the Herefords would compare very favourably with, say for example, with some of the things like Charolais and other things right at the top. But that, as we said, I think that extreme growth comes at a cost, so it's whether you want to go down that line. I'd use the hybrid vigour if you're in a commercial situation. So if you've got a hybrid cow like a black baldy, she's got the hybrid vigour, and then you use a terminal sire on top of that, easy carving limousan, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm, not necessarily. Yeah. Right, yeah, um, you said about K longevity. Hello. <laughs> uh, you said about K longevity at the end of your thing, quite specifically. Um, where would you push with that? Because I've found doing K weaning efficiency, once they get past 10, it sort of goes off a cliff a bit. So you push too hard for K longevity, keeping these older cows that then start looking after themselves, betting their calves, and you could be going down a dead end road there. Well, I, my oldest cow is 18. Yeah. She's still, I'll, st I'll keep her. So if, if I'm to make genetic progress, if I was totally focused on EBVs and, and just follow that line, I'd, I'd be killing 25% animals every year. All the bottom 25% would have to go automatically. But there's a lot of other factors, like longevity and all these things. And if, if they're doing the job, I keep them. I, I think that's it. It's, it's you, if you can see they're not doing a calf, can't you? So that's, that's time then. So that's your time. weight of your calf in, at weaning. So yeah. the bottom, a lot of this. And there's a trade-off. There's a trade-off there in terms of the cost of your culling rate. And also, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, can you just say a bit more about overwintering outside? Uh, did, did you, uh, Rob, you said you did that anyway. Um, did you always do that? And did you encounter problems uh, and, and learn any particular lessons? And I think at Croom, you're relatively low lying, aren't you? Um, all, all of our land's pretty low lying, so there'd be nothing over 100 metres above sea level. Um, we've um, we're on heavy clay, heavy lias clay, Evesham series. Um, so it's the worst kind of soil to do it on. Um, but I find as we build the organic matter with the mob grazing system, um, and the root, particularly the root structure is vital. So by allowing those rest periods, allowing the, the grasses to reach their full genetic potential and their size, the root mass is also doing that. And also the rest period is allowing the, um, the fungal 
associations in the soil and the diversity helps that as well because all the different plants have got fungal associations with, with different fungi and the fungal hyphae, like even in the winter, in the best places, you can go in a wet time, dig a spade, and it's pretty dry in the rain. You know, it's pretty dry, it's, it's firm underfoot, and it's amazing, you can see all the fungal hyphae in there. And I think a combination of that plus the litter on the top that you're leaving for your winter grazing. Uh, and I'm grazing the grass now in a way that will help me in the winter as well. So I'm leaving quite a lot behind so that I'll be trampling plenty in the winter. Um, if I, if, I shear it off, if I shear it off now in this weather, um, it's not going to grow back as well. Uh, it's also going to have a big impact on the soil and the soil moisture um, and then things compact and other things come in. In terms of water, we always move the water. We're lucky we tend to thaw out in the day because I've got overland pipes, but I also keep the uh, grass and the grazing around stand pipes till last in a field so that I can always easily defrost water if I need to. Um, at Croom, I've got there's a mile long man-made river which is actually a lake and so I always keep the buffer along the edge of that lake till last for the for if I get freezing weather and if you know when it's been really wet and the wettest winter was the first year we did it when the soil wasn't quite ready and I was moving them twice a day um, in usually well ever since then I've moved them every two days sometimes every three in the winter um, and becoming more relaxed about when I move the back fence in the winter because it's the dormant season, so you're not grazing regrowth. Um, but yeah, it's a learning curve, and I'm glad that I decided, I had a few years without snow, um, but I'm glad I decided to do the bale grazing and settle the bales out before this winter, because um, that could have been, that would have been difficult. I'm also outwintering, so I've outwintered 100, 110 animals, 15 years running now. And, and one of the things I say to visitors is, do you think 100 odd cows have been outwintered here? Because they all say, oh, we can't do it. It's, um, it's, it. We can't do it on our land, this and that. So I'm on tricky land, river meadows and everything. Um, the key is not to do anything two days running so you, or, or two years running. So if you're going to feed in one place, make sure you feed in another place the year after. But um, I went, I saw this first in a farm in Leicestershire who had this lovely ridge and furrow. And if they, if they, they were feeding in round feeders and longhorn cattle, and if they couldn't be bothered to move their round feeder, it was just a pudding. But if they moved it every day, even in the wet, wettest winter, the ground recovered. And I also carve in the autumn, and the baby calves stay out with the cows all winter. And there are days that you think, hmm, you feel a bit sorry for them. But come the spring and come the grass, they grow like absolute stink. And they're by far the most economic thing I do. We never lose them. They never, you know, they get through. Um, EBVs and selection for selection criteria. At what point in the percentiles do you start calling an animal an extreme performer? Well, that's your own judgment, really, isn't it? Because at the moment, those are set by the breed societies. So you could, it, it might be, if you were looking at a, a EBV for grain consumption, we'd be looking right down the far end, you know, wouldn't we? As far away from the you're looking extreme the other way for grass. So again, it's, you've, got to, you've got to sort of get your head around how the statistics are made and choose what's going to suit you. Because you won't, the perfect animal isn't there, is it? I, I think if for terminal, I mean, I always um, make myself unpopular when I go to the Aberdeen Angus meetings and say, well, if you really wanted to have extreme growth off grain, you'd probably have a Belgian blue. Um, but it's one of those things that if it says, if there's lots of sort of big flashy posters that say top 1% of for 600 day weight, then you might be one to avoid. Yeah. So we, we haven't, either, neither of us have got rid of our proper British genetics from our herds. There's a place. And, it, and certainly when we see them in the butchery, some more traditional Herefords will yield a lot more meat after boning out than some of these bigger carcasses with lots of bone in. You know, the butcher mm -hmm. will say, well, that fills up the block. You know what I mean? And, and that's not measured in EBVs at all, the actual no. yield, is it? No, a, a modern Angus will, will, the limits really on it are, they tend to steers or grade an, an R, and there's a lot of O plus. Um, but the native Angus, you saw that the picture of those bulls, they'll, they'll go on and grade a U, you know, it's... Um, but again, as a butcher, 
connect that much more in the sirloin in the back, that much length, is the best part of 70 quid retail. We, top side goes for mint half the time. You know, we don't sell to the quality end of the beef market. They don't buy top side for roasting. We end up mincing it, but we could, if we had an animal, <laughs> as long as we could get, it would be, we're going to increase as long as it's capacity. Functional. Yeah, as long as it doesn't yeah. crack in the bath. In the bath. Come on. Um, uh, what, what kind of li livestock units per acre are you carrying? And do either of you make hay, or do you just buy everything? Well, I, I have a totally, I have 550 acres, which is just totally sustainable. So it sustains those 100 odd cows and their calves and 350 ewes and their lambs. And then we make enough fodder there to, to keep it. So it just shows how little, if we have to feed the population, it just shows how little meat you, you, they would be able to eat pasture fed from that land. But then th surely that's the answer, to eat a lot less meat that's better quality. And that's, so that's all it produces. And if I push the stocking rate, I get problems um, health-wise. Vet, my vet's bill is, what, three or four pound a cow? I, I think I, it's an important question uh, because the stocking rate is massive in terms of profitability. Um, and it's something that when I was just grazing stockpile, I was grazing 45 steers through 130 acres of stockpile. And that I left that as my stocking rate because that's my winter carrying capacity. Um, with, the, with the bale feeding, which I trialled last year, and we'll be doing it far more intensively this year, I think I can get up to about 1.8 acres per cow, which is about industry standard. And if I can have industry standard, but I've got a third of the costs, wintering costs, um, then, you know, I'm in the top 1% in terms of profitability. Hi. Would, would either of you care to comment on the, um, the impact on pasture-fed um, suckler production of uh, spring calving versus autumn calving? Well, we have different ideas. <laughs> my, yeah, my, the, the way I'm going now is to carve more in the autumn um, and then to carve those heifers from the autumn calving herd very young and probably keep less cows and carve a, a whole bunch of, say, 30 heifers this time of year and then which uh, only a third of them will be select, have to go back in the herd and the others will be fattened up. So I'm getting, I'm getting more growth from my heifers and an extra calf. So I think that's going to be my system. And the spring, the spring calvers will just um, um, be, the, you know, just be topping up, the ones that don't quite make it back to the bull. So we have two six-week periods and we allow them to slip one once to the other herd, but not twice. And um, that's, that's going to be, be my way forward. And, and it's, it, it's the 30 month rule really doesn't apply. Y you hear a lot about it, but it means now I can, as um, long as they're under 48 months, they'll, they'll rear a calf, grow extra, and then we'll fatten them for the butchery and perhaps get better meat. But um, autumn calving is a dream. You know, they, the cows get fat as butter, but they never get big calves. They sort of manage themselves and they calve easily, and it's nice weather. and. Yeah, those calves will get through the winter. We're calving first of May, so um, and we're wanting to tighten our uh, calving pattern. So at the moment we're we're about two and a half cycles that I'll let I took the bull out. And we want to get down to two cycles, um, 42 days, 40, 45 days if we can. Um, I I just like the fact that if they they're as they come out of the winter, they're onto the spring grass, gets the oxytocin going. You've got, you know, increasing daylight has an impact on the, on them as well in terms of getting ready for calving. Um, and as, do, as a rule, doesn't get them too fat as you're coming through there. Um, this year, we've had a few, you have had a few stragglers just because of when I bought heifers in and I bought some in calf. And uh, so calving, uh, you know, we had two calved yesterday, um, you know, I think when you're getting into the end of, well, basically you don't want to be haymaking and carving at the same time. So, well, this is the management to keep your labour costs as down as they've got to suit you as much as, haven't they, as themselves. 
and, and, and every breed has the traits to do, all, all the British native breeds have the traits to do what you want to do, and you can identify them, and, you, and then you mould a herd to suit your farm, really, don't you? But we, we're aiming, when we've got the peak requirements on the cow, um, we want to have our, our peak forage, and the other, th the other side of that is also that we want to have good enough quality forage as we come through the summer from when they're coming to breed them back. Um, so we, you know, potentially that could be more difficult, obviously not for you in the winter, but you know, I, I just want to make sure my breeding percentage is as high as it can be. How many uh, groups are you running and how does that look over different times of the year? How many breeds? Groups. How many groups, groups. of cows? How many mobs are you running? Is that Hannah? Yes, hello. hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I have several mobs. The trouble with pedigree breeding is you've got to keep the, you can't just put a whole load of bulls into a whole load of cows. So I do have to, at bulling time, probably run three or four mobs. But then later in the year, it'll, it'll, it'll all join up and just be two mobs. And then I can, I'm obviously, I'm not as grazing as intensively as Rob, but I can put like 150 animals into an area. Yeah. And blitz it. Yeah. Similar really. So we, we're running about, 30 cows to, to the bull, and so we're in. We're going to have three different groups, um, 10 in the third group. Um, so, uh, and then we'll, but we'll we'll bring everything in, and then the older cows you can bring your um, your bulling heifers. Uh, the first time bulling heifers can come into the into the group with the with the older cows. And that's the benefit if you're running maternal bulls as well, because then they're going to work um, with the with the first calf heifers. But we do try and keep them down to as few groups as possible. It helps that we've, in a way, it helps that we've got three separate farms that we're managing. Any more questions? Anybody else? Uh, thank you. Uh, what recommendations would you both have for uh, seed mixes or seed enhancements that could enhance the pastures for overwintering period, uh, in specifically in wet areas? Well. I do you want to go? Well, I'm, I'm sort of limited. I'm a whole farm HLS, so I have very little. So we planted the stewardship mix in the bottom, and the cows, the cows have done their job, haven't they? Fantastic, the, cows, yeah. the cows have actually Brilliant. got the mix that suits them, um, all by accident. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we started off with a basic stewardship mix, and it's developed into something that'll stand overwintering in the wet and plenty of, plenty of growth. Um, I find the little herbs at haymaking the most important, the trefoils and little tiny things like that. And if you can adapt your haymaking to get all those into the bale, you've actually got a much better, you know, that's equal to two bales of ryegrass as far as I'm concerned. But um, at, at home I grow lucerne. I think everybody should grow lucerne for fattening the cattle and protein. So we don't need to buy any protein in. And um, it should be much more grown, much more widely. Yeah, Rob's an expert on grasses. We've got time for one more question. Hang on. I'd just quickly say about the grasses side would be if your wet areas, tall fescue is a really, really useful one. Um, it's, uh, it's really tusky. It's, it's everything that you've, we've been told that we shouldn't have. Um, so it's probably, I tend to look at that and say, well, that, that'll do. Coxfoot's great. If you let it go to um, its full potential you get huge cox but you know I'm walking through cox but up here at the moment so you know huge huge volume once you allow it to get to its full size and those deep roots those roots will go down a couple of meters in good soil so your infiltration it changes the soil it, the infiltration changes the impact after rain um, lucerne's deep rooting red clover's deep rooting uh, if you've got if you've got light land then the sand point is really good as a companion to the, the legumes because of the tannins help prevent bloat. If you've got heavy land, then bird's foot trefoil, and the, and the commercial bird's foot trefoil is actually quite productive. It's a really good mix with red clover. I always, and I'll frost seed that red clover and bird's foot trefoil because we're on clay. So the frost just scarifies the seed. And as long as you've got soil contact after with winter grazing, that works well. And then you've got, you haven't got to worry about the bloat issue because the tannins in the bird's foot trefoil. Uh, Rob, you said you were rolling out uh, your bales of, of wildflower um, uh, hay, uh, but you also said you were standing them up in a way I didn't quite understand. 
Yeah, so I, I, was, I was rolling them out. I was interesting. I saw, uh, or actually talking to via Twitter, uh, one of the grass-fed uh, pedigree Angus breeders in Canada. And on a wet time, they'll, instead of rolling them out, they'll just, they'll just roll them onto the flat end, take, take the net wrap off, and let cattle feed around it. And yes, they waste some, but they, they pull it underneath them. And, and where you have a ring feeder, you know, the bit next to the ring is, gets really trodden up. But I find with, if you just leave it without a ring feeder, then yes, they waste a bit more, but I work about 20, um, 2,650 kilo cows to a bale per day. Um, and that's, so you can work your cost out from that. They make very little mess, you'd be amazed, because they all are yeah. hungry and go to feed at once, all rounded. They make very little mess. And uh, you can do it with um, silage bales, and they also need to be tipped on their end, and you can get, you just leave the little disc of plastic underneath it. And again, they waste very, very little. But you compare that to the cost of having them inside, the straw this year, and and muck hauling and all these things, you can afford that little bit of waste by yeah. miles, can't you? Time and, it, and time again. And it's not, it's not waste, is it? No, yeah, just yeah. going back in. And then you're moving your fence to the bales, do you see? Yeah. So, yeah, you put the bales out in lines, then the fence moves to them. Okay. Just following on from that, do you have to, does it recover naturally, or do you have to do anything to it, the, the feeding area? The what? Hey? The feeding area where you recovers fed the naturally. Bales. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. recovers. Yeah, yeah. What I will do around water troughs uh, with a movable water trough, it, if it does get a bit poached or if I put it in the wrong place, I just follow it up with. Um, I wish I'd never called it this, but the lo I call them love bombs, which is just all those species I talked about just then with the deep roots and everything. I just I just throw some seed on wherever there's some bare ground, just to provide some competition, some weed competition in there. Um, and I think that, and it, and it covers up very quickly. Um, but in years, you won't need that. And, and there'll be enough no. seed in the bales to reseed it. So but that's yep. the other thing is if you think about because of the way we graze as well, or with the mob grazing, you're letting a lot of grass seed and it's going quite mature. The amount of seed drop from an entire field like that is probably about three or four times what you'd put on if you were broadcasting it on. And so by changing your grazing, you're actually providing weed competition and you know, you go and, go and have a look at Croom Court now, if you like, where we, we're grazing at the moment, and we've been doing this for, for four years, and some pretty horrible winters, as there's not a weed to see. And the, the cattle do spread. I, I inherited some ryegrass layers that the cows now have seeded perfectly. You know, all those species that are on the stewardship layers are now in the ryegrass layers, and the cows have carried them there and developed them. I, I remember one of my neighbours, um, he, he grows a lot of hay with Westerwald, with the Westerwald ryegrass, and on the packet he always used to laugh because the first year he lets it go to seed. Rob knows this chap quite well because uh, it reseeds itself, and he always showed on the packet it said, "Whatever you do with the Westerwald ryegrass, don't let it go to seed." Mm. You know why they put that on? <laughs> right. They said I could talk forever, but I think you do pretty well. <laughs> uh, I really like to thank you ever so much. It's just a huge wealth of knowledge that comes from. Rob and Simon, and they've been very helpful in uh, the growth of the pasture fed. And I do encourage you to, to join. Um, we're not commercial, we're a community interest company. We're largely run by volunteers. We are what I call uh, the gift economy, uh, sharing of knowledge. So uh, do consider joining. Just one thing, when you mentioned Coxfoot, I remember when I was a student, we had to, there was a book of grasses, we had to learn about 150 <coughs> grasses and um, we had to learn all the Latin names. And I was asked to sp say grace some years ago. Fortunately, they were not all agriculturalists. I couldn't think of anything to say. So I just said, stood up and said, lolium perenne, dactylus glomerata, <laughs> um, which if you don't know, are the Latin names of ryegrass and coxfoot. <laughs> and it went down an absolute peach. <laughs> so um, it's been absolutely stunning, uh, what the, your knowledge. Thank you ever so much for sharing it with you. <laughs> yeah.